we're in a, uh, uh, th this is actually a pretty laid back conference and in some ways different uh, than the uh, earlier ones. We're not doing expositions of scripture. In some ways what we're doing is trying to apply the theology we believe to the subject of work and vocation. We're going to do that in a number of different ways. Uh, you're going to hear a couple of talks. You're going to certainly hear a number of panel discussions in which, you're, which we're trying to assemble people with very different backgrounds, all Christians, of course, people from the work world, the business world, uh, people who, like myself, who, where the, I'm a pastor, a theologian. We're trying to bring people together to talk about what it means uh, to bring our faith to bear on our work. And uh, some of you know... Uh, if you're pastors, that this is an area that nobody trained you to do. You know, you, nobody trained you in seminary to do uh, this, that is to disciple people for their public life. Uh, many of you may, perhaps have heard me use the story. I mean, it really came home to me when a, a, uh, an actor who had become a Christian at Redeemer, a uh, television actor, came to me and said, now that I'm a Christian, I need help I would you like you to, would you disciple me? And I said, sure, I know how to do that. How to lead a Bible study, how to share your faith, how to lead a small group. Uh, and I said, no, no, I, I, what roles can I take? Now that I'm a Christian, uh, I know I don't only have to take roles in stories that are Christian stories, but in television, on, in movies and theater, what, what are good stories for, for people? Uh, how does my Christian faith guide me to know what kind of roles I should take? And I suddenly realized, I don't think I missed, I must have missed that lecture at seminary. Uh, this is a huge area. And even people who are afraid of the cultural engagement issue, there are many people who, don't, who get nervous when we talk about cultural engagement. They say, isn't the job of the church to simply preach the word and bring people to faith in Christ and uh, uh, just, just do that? That's, that's, when it comes to uh, cultural engagement, that's not our job. Our job is just to bring people to faith in Christ. Okay. What does that mean? Well, you evangelize and you disciple them. Okay. What do you mean disciple them? Well, you teach them to obey Christ in every area of their life. Okay. Uh, that means what about people who are working? And they're working out in the public spheres, in the spheres of culture. What does it mean for them to be disciples of Christ out there? And won't that actually engage culture? And the answer is yes. So what I want to do... Um, is talk to you about um, uh, f four or five ways that I think your faith can influence and shape your work. I start with a, with a story, a classic illustration from Alistair McIntyre in After Virtue, a uh, very important book to read. There's a very funny illustration in the book. Uh, he, he asks you to imagine that you're standing at a bus stop when a young man you do not know never met before, comes up to you and says, the name of the common wild duck is Histrionic oh, Histrionicus, Histrionicus, Histrionicus. Now, even though you understand the sentence, you know what he said, his action makes no sense to you because you, you, you don't know what it means. And as soon as you try to figure out why he said it and what he meant and what the whole thing means, uh, the only way to make sense of it is to try to put it into a story. So, for example, you say, maybe this person is mentally ill. That would explain why a man who you never met comes up to you and tells you the Latin name for the common wild duck. Maybe he's mentally ill. Uh, that's a story, and that makes sense of what happened. The other possibility is you say, this is from the book, what if yesterday someone of your age, height, and general appearance uh, had approached the young man in the library asking him the Latin word for the common wild duck, and today he has mistaken you for that person, sees you at the bus stop, and comes up and says, oh yeah, the name of the common wild duck is Histri Histrionicus, Histrionicus, Histrionicus. That would explain it. Here's another possibility. It's possible that the young man is a foreign spy waiting at a prearranged rendezvous and uttering the ill-chosen code sentence which will identify him to his contact. Now, depending on what... That would make sense, too, of it, right? So there's a three different stories, 
and they all make sense of what just happened. And what you're going to do now depends on which story you put that event into, right? So one of the things you could do is you could, you could try to kill him. <laughs> you know, he's a foreign spy, probably here to assassinate somebody. If he's mentally ill, that would be really a shame. On the other hand, you might call the police, uh, or you might, uh, uh, you might try to engage him in a conversation. In other words, no matter what you do, it'll be on the basis of your understanding of what happened. Your understanding will be based on the story in which you put the event. Your work will make no sense to you unless you put it into some kind of story. I do think there's a lot of Christians who, the story is this, that in church I'm doing God's work, out here I'm just trying to make a living so that I can do God's work at church, so I can give money to the missionaries who are doing God's work. Uh, that, that is one story, and as a result, I would say, if that's the story, first of all, you'll make no effort to actually shape your work by your faith. You'll seal your, your faith away from your work. I have to say, it is the way of least resistance, because what you'll do is you'll just blend in with the way work is done in the field. Uh, you won't ask, well, is this a, is this a, you know, does this reflect Christian values? Is, you, know, you won't have to do any of that hard work. That story is a story that actually makes a fair amount of, uh, you know, makes sense. I don't think it's what the Bible says because Jesus is a king, and he's a king, therefore, of every area of your life. You can't, you can't do that. The story that we have to put uh, work into so it makes sense is creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Uh, in a book that uh, I wrote along with uh, Catherine Leary Allsdorf, who's going to be up here, Every Good Endeavor, uh, what we tried to lay out in the book was that very idea. Unless you understand God is the creation, the creator of all things, and that everything he created was good, unless you understand that we're fallen, very uh, fallen in such a way, not that we're as bad as we could be, but what I learned in seminary about total depravity, total depravity is not that you're as bad as you could be, but if sin was blue, you'd be blue all over. Uh, meaning that every part of your life, you know, your mind wheel, your, your emotions, uh, public, private, uh, it's not like in the church everything is sacred and out here everything is profane. Sin is distorting every part of your life. Thirdly, redemption, which is that it's not just that your sins are forgiven, but into your life has come the Holy Spirit and you are now a new creation. And the new creation means all things are made new. And that, has to, that can't just say, oh, my family life gets renewed, but my work life does not. And restoration, which means God's, as we've talked about earlier today, and maybe you were at that other conference, you probably were, uh, we talked about the fact that the resurrection means that uh, God is not simply taking us into a, a spiritual netherworld, but he's restoring this world, this material creation, uh, which shows you the goodness of work and the future of work and so on. Now, one of the things you could do and probably would be a little more of a high theological lecture, is to uh, go through creation, fall, redemption, restoration, and say, how does every one of these things affect how we think of work? But I would like to get a little more practical than that in my last 15 minutes here. And I'd like to give you those four or five fairly practical ways that the theology of the Bible shapes the way you do your work. Here they go. Number one. Faith gives you an inner ballast. Now, we're going to get real practical and personal right away. Faith gives you an inner ballast without which work could destroy you. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones was a physician who became a pastor and preacher. Some of you know that. He was very aware that some professions in particular, he thought medicine was one of them. But honestly, it's true of an awful lot of professions now. It's probably true of the business world, surely, and others too. He says he thought that there's an awful lot of me uh, medical men he knew, and this is back when all the, all the doctors were men. Uh, Lloyd-Jones said that most of the medical men he knew, when they die, you probably could just stick a, uh, on their gravestone, you could put this, born a man, died a doctor. And what he meant is that it becomes your identity. You can't imagine yourself not being a doctor, and therefore, your whole identity is based on you being a doctor, not being a Christian. Your self-worth, your self-importance, your sense of, you know, competence is wrapped up in your work. Now, 
I could make, if I had the time, I could make a case that in, uh, in more traditional cultures, uh, if you come from a traditional culture, say you come from Asia in the past, uh, which is a traditional culture, the way in which you got your self-worth was by fulfilling the role in the family that you, uh, that you were assigned. So, for example, it was being a good father or a good mother, a good son, a good daughter. That's, if you were good at that role, then you could look yourself in the mirror and say, I'm a good person. So where does work fit in that view of the world? Work is a means to an end. The reason I want to be successful is for my family. And as long as I'm, I have a good family and I'm being good to my family, then I, I'm, you know, I'm a good person. So work is a means to an end. Now, there's problems with that culture too, but I want to talk about Western culture. In Western culture, work is an end in itself because we're an individualistic culture, and that means we're told in a hundred million different ways from the time we're little, you can be anything you want to be. You have to decide who you want to be and then be it. And so we, we get our self-worth through our work. It's our work. It's, if I'm successful at this, I'm an artist, I'm a business person, I make money, I'm the, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I've written the great American novel. That becomes our identity, and as a result, you really get enslaved. Success in work, if work is your identity, if you're successful, it goes to your head. If you're a failure, it goes to your heart. If, you're a, if, you, if, if work is your identity and you, and you get successful, it destroys you because it makes you full of yourself. It makes you uh, think, you know, it's just true. If you're a good doctor and you're very successful at that, or you're a good businesswoman or bus businessman, you make a lot of money. Because of the self-justifying nature of the human heart, you think, because I'm good in one thing, I'm smart about everything. And you think you're smart about uh, who to choose to marry, and you're not. You're as stupid as everybody else. <laughs> you, you, uh, you think, well, because I did really good in this business deal, I'll, I'm the kind of person that has enough insight, I'll, I'll be great at the next business deal, and you won't be. You'll be overconfident. If, if work is the meaning, if work is your identity, if your self-worth is based on your identity, then even if you're successful, it destroys you by puffing you up. But if you're not successful, it destroys you by, dis it goes to your heart. Um, you know, I, there was, a, I was reading about a, a man, he's not a Christian, but he was in the New York Times some, not too long ago. He read an, wrote an article about how bad it is if you're a writer, he's a writer, and he says, he says, I realized that being a good writer was everything to me. That's who I was. My, my whole worth was bound up in my writing. And he said, I began to realize that I had lost all perspective. I couldn't look at something I had written and really look at it honestly because I needed it for it to be great. So your whole life gets distorted. You have to have a deep identity, a deep certainty of your worth. You have to have a a sense of your value grounded in something not your performance and not in your work. It's got to be in Christ. And so that whole area, to, see, to me, the whole area of redemption, what it means to be redeemed in Christ, has profound impact on how you do your work. Secondly, let me just keep running through here. Um, faith also gives you a concept of the dignity and worth of all work, even simple work, without which work could bore you. Remember what the first point was? First point is faith gives you an inner ballast without which work could, could destroy you. But secondly, faith gives you a concept of the dignity and worth of all work, even simple work, without which work could bore you. Now listen carefully. Martin Luther is the one who helps us the most here. Very helpful. Martin Luther looks at a lot of places in the Bible that says God feeds every living thing. God loves everything he's made and he feeds every living thing. There's other places in the Bible where it says, it is God who uh, strengthens the bars of your gates, which of course is a way of saying, who keeps your city, uh, your society, strong and secure. And then he says, okay, God, God's taking credit for that. God's saying, I feed you. I keep your city safe. But he says, actually, think about it. How is God doing that? How is God feeding you? He's feeding you through the farmers. He's, he's feeding you through the simplest farm girl who milks the cow. He's feeding you through the humblest uh, uh, truck driver who drives the, the, you know, uh, the milk to the dairy and then to the store. He says, in other words, the people who do the simplest kinds of work 
are actually the fingers of God, Luther says, or the masks of God. God is loving you and doing things to you, and he has chosen to do it through the work of other people. And therefore, all work, all work is actually God's work. It's God's way of caring for his creation. Now, unless you have the theology that helps you see that, especially in our particular culture, in our culture, we value, uh, if you go to college, you value work that saves people's lives. You know, you, you, I, want, I want to do technology, which makes people's lives better. I want to give a lot of money away, so I help the starving in Africa. I want to have status. I want to be the best at what I want to do. But you, when you look at somebody who's just doorman or a janitor, you say, oh, my goodness. But <laughs> if your biblical theology should show you that all work is good work, all work that's done well that helps somebody else is good work, it's God's work. Of course, obviously not producing pornography. You understand what I'm talking about. But all work. And I, uh, I do see especially Reformed-type Christians who tend to be white-collar people, not all, but they tend to be white-collar people, participating in the sneering attitude that the culture now has to people who, who do the, you know, they, live in, they work in the service industry, they don't make a lot of money, they push a broom. You realize unless somebody cleans your house, you're going to die. You realize that? That's, that? That sweeping your house and cleaning off the tabletops is your very life. You're going to die. If you don't do it or somebody does it, you call that simple work, but it's, it's God's way of making, strengthening the bars of your gates. And unless you see this, this is one aspect, I'll get to another aspect that Reformed people like to talk about. What Luther was willing to bring out was what that means is the way to do work as a Christian is to do it well. Because, see, in other words, if, if God is feeding the world through you as a farmer, then what does it mean to be a Christian farmer? Hmm? What does it mean to be a Christian farmer? It means to produce great food for a great price. Or, uh, you know, to put more a fine point on it, if you are a Christian airline pilot, what does it mean to be a truly Christian airline pilot? Land the plane. <laughs> Smoothly. Your passengers don't need... You know, if you can talk to your passengers about Jesus when you're up there, that's great. That's fine. But that is kind of icing on the cake. You need to land the plane. And, and Lutheran... Listen, Luther, uh, there's a man named William Deal who's a Lutheran layperson. He was an executive at Bethlehem Steel for years who wrote a lot of book on the integration of faith and work. And because he was Lutheran, because he had this understanding, which is right, absolutely right, it's, the good, it's work as God's way of caring for his creation so that all work, all legitimate work, even the simplest kind of work is God's work. So that no matter, even if you don't have a job that's really exciting, it, even though it, you might tend to be bored with it, you got the right theology and you know what I'm doing matters. And when you see other people, you don't look down at anybody's work. Well, William Deal actually uh, developed something he called the ministry of competence. And he pointed out that a lot of Christians kind of overthink, what does it mean to be a Christian this or a Christian that in my work? And he says, the ministry of competence is be, be the best. Be the best at what you do. That's one way to be a Christian in your work. So faith gives you the ballast without which work can, inner ballast without which work can kill you and destroy you. Faith gives you a concept of the dignity and worth of even simple work without which work could bore you. Thirdly, faith gives you a moral compass without which work could corrupt you. Um, there is a lot of pressure. There is no doubt about it. Uh, because, of the, because of the global economy, um, there, there is so much pressure for profitability. There's so many companies that years, over the years, just, just need to make enough profit to you know, pay, keep the lights on and pay your employees and give your investors a bit of a return. And now, uh, there's so much need for uh, squeezing every bit of profitability out of it. And there's a tremendous amount of, uh, a tremendous, a tremendous amount of uh, uh, pressure to cut corners and to uh, do whatever it takes to turn the profit. And one of the things that's so awful right now in this world is in, when you go to college, you're going to be told that morality is relative. It's relative. That uh, it's, it's person-specific and it's culturally relative and nobody's to say what is right or wrong. And then you get out into the world and you're going to have all kinds of temptations to cut corners and do things that are 
that are uh, dishonest, don't, lack integrity, don't really not, lack of transparency. And then if you get caught, you're going to be they're going to slam you. They're they're going to take you to the cleaners. They're going to put they're going to they're going to take you to the newspapers. And you're going to say, "Hey, I was told everything is relative, but then it's just because I did this and this and that." That's where we are today. Unless you've got a strong inner moral compass that comes from being a Christian, you're going to have a lot of trouble. You're going to have a lot of trouble saying, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to tell the investors what it's really worth. I'm, 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 not going to, I'm, not, I'm not going to sin by omission, just leave that out. I'm going to be more transparent with my customers. I'm going to do it, and you might lose your job. But in the long run, it's a whole lot better to have that moral compass. Uh, I know a man who is at the top of one of the a big uh, uh, bank in uh, Britain, who to- he's a Christian, and he told me recently. By the way, the bank has been in the news, like so many of the banks, for all sorts of moral issues and uh, uh, you know scandal, etc. And he said there was a kind of off-the-record little clandestine meeting of the top of the top of the top, and they said, "What are we going to do to put a? Uh, we got to get values back in this organization." Years ago, even 20 years ago, this is Britain now, they said there was all sorts of things. It wasn't illegal, but you just didn't treat customers like that. You just didn't take that much money out for yourself. You just didn't do these things. It just wasn't done. It, it, just, it wasn't the decent thing to do. In the last 15, 20 years, all that's gone away, and we do everything that's legal and then some. And he said, what are we going to do? They said, t- one person said, what are we going to do to get values back in the company? You know what everybody else said to them? Whose values? How do you define morality? We don't know how to define morality anymore. You can't get the genie back in the bottle culturally right now. But if you're a Christian, you have that moral compass. Otherwise, you could really get corrupted. Lastly, briefly, um, the Christian faith does give you a world and life view uh, that shapes the character of your work without which work could master and use you. what I mean by that is, now this is what you were mo- probably expecting me to say earlier, if you're a reform type and you get around one of these kinds of conversations. Uh, it is true that what does it mean to be a good airline, a Christian airline pilot, land the plane? What does it mean to be a, uh, a Christian ditch digger, dig the ditch? What does it mean to be a Christian elementary school teacher? What does it mean to be a Christian playwright? See, that depends on what you... Th- To be a Christian elementary school teacher really depends on what you think a human being should be and what you think will lead to human flourishing. And what you what 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 are you trying to produce? You're trying to produce a particular kind of human being. Well you suddenly you realize without uh you're under without a worldview, you're going to not really know what a human being should be. If you're a playwright, you have to ask yourself questions of, of what is right and wrong and you know, what is it, where we should be going as a, as a society, what kind of stories do I want to tell? And so the fact is, when it gets right down to it, you do need a world and life view. You do need to take your Christian values and ask yourself questions about uh, what kind of plays should I write because what kind, of, what kind of things do people need, what kind of stories do people need. So a Christian must think out how his or her faith will distinctively shape their work. Notice I'm, I'm kind of creating a, I'm walking a, a line between uh, the approach that says all work is God's work and all work, if you do it well, is work for God. That usually goes along with the Luther's, with Luther's view. I also want to say, but frankly, there are especially certain kinds of uh, jobs in which you have to actually think out what are the implications of Christian values and biblical teaching for the way in which I do my work out here in the world, you know, even among, among people, whether they're believers or not. So I think that's all very important. Here's one last thing. In the book, Every Good Endeavor, um, there's a great story that we, I, it's, a, it's a story by J.R.R. Tolkien, which I, we tell. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a short story about a, a, a painter who has this vision of a tree that he's been trying to paint. And his whole life, he can never get much of it done. In fact, just before he dies, he, the, whole, his, the great painting he was working on, all he ever did was get out a leaf, one leaf. Uh, but then he goes, he, he dies, and he gets on a train, and he's going to uh, the afterlife. And when he gets to, the, to heaven, as it were, there's his tree. And he realized he sensed the tree as an artist, and he realized that everybody someday would see the tree. And one of the things that, here's the last thing that your Christian faith can give you is hope. 
Because if you go into law, you want to do justice. If you go into city planning, you want to build great cities. If you go into art, you want to show people beauty. And when you actually get into those places, you're going to find because of the fall, because thorns and thistles come up in, from the ground, uh, very often you, you can work for years and years and years and only ever get one leaf out. But Christianity gives you hope and says that the, the passions we have to see the human race be all that God made it to be, and we're trying to realize through our work, even if in this life, because of the frustrating nature of, uh, of, of the, the world now, this fallen world, we often are going to be very, very frustrated. We may only get a leaf out. There's hope. There is a tree, as it were. The, 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 if you're a city planner, there is a new Jerusalem. If you're a lawyer, there will be a time of perfect righteousness and justice. He comes to judge the earth. And so the hope that helps us through frustrating times, the inner ballast and sense of who we are in Christ that uh, keeps us from being you know, uh, whipped back and forth because of success and failure, the vision of God just caring for creation through his work so that all work is good work and God's work, all these things are absolutely crucial. For us to be disciples, not just on the weekend <laughs> when we're at church, but out in the world, truly doing everything God, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, obeying everything Jesus Christ told us to do. Now, what we're going to do at this point is we're going to move uh, into a time of panel. I'm going to pray. The panel is going to get ready to come on up here. And then we're going to move into the next part of our conference. So would you pray with me? Dear Father, we thank you for uh, even these snatches of, uh, uh, of insight from your word about what it means to let uh, our faith shape our work. We not only want that to happen with our work, but we want to be disciplers of people. And we have people coming and asking us questions about what does it mean to be a Christian in every area of life, and we don't know how to do it. We pray that you would equip us better as uh, disciple makers because we've spent these couple of hours together here this afternoon. We thank you, Lord, that, um, that you're a worker, that you created the world in joy, that you got your hands dirty, you put yourself, your hands right into the dust and made us. And we pray that you would show us how to be workers uh, made in the image of God and following in your footsteps. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.